Hello there everyone, and welcome to the very first video on the History with Kev channel. A channel where I, Kev, talk about history. And whilst I'll be mainly focusing on more narrowly defined topics such as great historical figures or battles or whatever in the future, I thought I'd start with something nice and easy that I already know a lot about. So what better place to start than with the history of my own little hometown? And by little, I actually mean major urban centre, with over a million inhabitants, which is the second largest city in the UK. Now if you've heard anything about Birmingham, it's probably that Black Sabbath or J.A.R. Tolkien were from here, but we are so much more than Gollum and Ozzy Osbourne, I promise. Birmingham is located here, in the middle of Britain, in the West Midlands to be precise, atop the Birmingham Plateau, a raised area of land which tops out at around 1,000 feet above sea level, which is not very high by world standards, but this is England we're talking about, so that makes Birmingham positively Himalayan by comparison to most other places. Oh yeah, and here it rains. It rains a lot. The locals of the city are known as Brummies, which derives from an old name for the settlement, that being Brummagem in Middle English, which is the derivation of the shortening of the town name Brum, which you'll hear me refer to the city as several times in this video. And apparently, according to outsiders, our accent and local dialect are particularly distinctive and unpleasant. But personally, I reckon it's Boston. I don't know what you am going on about, you yampiefers. And if you understood that, well done. You're almost certainly from around these parts. But anyways, on to the history of the place. There's evidence of human activity in the Birmingham area dating all the way back to 8000 BCE. But don't worry, I won't be taking you through all of the intermittent 10,000 years because frankly, who has the time? And especially given that the human activity for the first few thousand years seems to have been in the form of seasonal and temporary settlements. So we'll fast forward a cheeky 80 centuries to the first proper settlement in the area, which crops up in the middle of the first century CE, or AD if you're still using the old dating system. That first settlement was built by the Romans and it's called Metchley Fort in the modern day Birmingham suburb of Edgebaston in the southern part of the modern city. Although of course Metchley Fort is not what the Romans would have called it, but so minor a site was it within the Greater Empire that we have no idea what they actually did call it. Metchley was a Roman fort built in the usual defensive style with an outer earthen embankment, wooden walls and double ditches. The site was constructed within a couple of years of the Roman invasion of Britannia in 43 CE. Here you can see the partially reconstructed earthen embankment in the grounds of what is now the current Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. In Roman times though, the site became a hub of the local road network with Icknild Street, Ricknild Street passing through the area which intersected with the two great cross-country Roman roads of Watling Street and Foss Way, very much making it the Spaghetti Junction of classical antiquity Britannia. And for those watching who aren't locals, Spaghetti Junction is this concrete monstrosity which exists in the modern city. Its official name is the Gravelly Hill Interchange, although I've literally never ever heard anyone call it that in my entire life. But anyway, it's the confluence of various parts of Britain's motorway network, referred to as Spaghetti Junction because the aerial view of its hideousness makes it look kind of like a plate of spaghetti. Anyways, the point is, 2000 years ago we were a road transport hub, and thus it is again today. The more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. But anyways, back to the Romans. Alongside the military presence at Mitchley Fort, there is evidence of a Vicus, which is a small Roman civilian settlement which grew up alongside a military fort, and this was typical of most Roman fortified sites across the Empire. Although in this instance, the Vicus at Mitchley Fort was probably quite short-lived, as the Romans would abandon the site in 70 CE, only to reoccupy the site a few years later, only to then re-abandon the place 50 years later in 120 CE. And it's that kind of on and off commitment which rather typifies Rome's attitude towards these rain-soaked, unruly and ultimately unprofitable collection of islands off the coast of their main empire. Which is why Roman occupation of Britannia was always kind of doomed to failure, although as always in history, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Following the Roman abandonment of Britain, the Birmingham area, much like the rest of the country, fell into serious decline for the following several centuries, and it wasn't until the early 7th century that Birmingham appears again as a permanent settlement, and its modern name derived from the Old English word ham, meaning a home or settlement, and Bormingus, which was the name of the local tribal grouping, and Bormingus meant the people of the Borma, the Borma being a general name for a tribal leader or chieftain, so Birmingham literally means the home of the people of the tribal leader, which is convoluted 
enough to make the aforementioned Spaghetti Junction look orderly and neat. But despite it getting a relatively early start following the post-Roman collapse of Britannia, Birmingham had shrunk to a tiny place by the time it was mentioned in the famous Doomsday Book, which was a survey of his new British kingdoms by William the Conqueror, published in 1086. The city, then little more than a hamlet, gets mentioned under the name Birmingham, which I really don't need to comment on, other than to point out that the standardised spelling of words, including place names, was still centuries off at this point, and little did the people of the time know what future childish mirth would be aroused by their particular choice of lettering for the place's name. Moving on. Birmingham was listed in the Doomsday Book as belonging to William Fitz Ansgulf, and having just nine households with a total annual value to the Lord of just 20 shillings, or one pound per annum, which is pretty darn small, putting it comfortably in the bottom 40% of places referenced in the Doomsday Book. And at this time, the area of what would become the modern city was split between three counties, those being Warwickshire, Staffordshire and Worcestershire. And yes, for any Americans watching, that is how you pronounce those place names. Anyways, this three-way split is one of the reasons that Warwickshire County Cricket Club play at Edgebaston in Birmingham. Come on, you bears! Even though Birmingham isn't actually in the county of Warwickshire, and there are a number of those kind of weird discrepancies which were a problem for the city that would not be rectified until 1974. Yeah, British governing structures do not move quickly, to say the least. Anyways, it wasn't until a century following the Doomsday Book that Birmingham's growth into a major urban centre began, with the charters of 1166 and 1189, which established Brom as a market town within the land of Lord Peter de Birmingham, with the market taking place on the site which is now the Bull Ring, which is a major shopping centre in the modern city. Like I said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And not long after the charters created the market, another landmark of the place which still exists in the modern city was founded, that being the St. Martin in the Bull Ring Church, which was first built in 1263, although for full disclosure only the main tower and spire remain of the original, as the main body of the church was demolished and rebuilt by the Victorians, because they weren't always the most historically sensitive or cultured of peoples to ever exist. Yeah, that's my history hot take on the Victorians, a point I may return to in a future video. But anyways, back to medieval Brom. Moving around a mile down the Digbeth Derriten Road, we find yet another Middle Ages building, and one of my favourite buildings in the city, that being the Old Crown Pub, which was first built in 1368, although again for full disclosure, most of the modern structure was rebuilt in the 16th century. Now this place is amazing, especially being a tall man who has been frequently drunk in this building. Trying to fit safely through its tiny doorways and halls trying to find the toilets is one hell of an adventure in trying to not crack your head open. It's definitely worth a visit if you're ever in the city. But anyways, that small diversion aside, it was the establishment of the market and a general economic uptick in the area that led to Birmingham's expansion, meaning that by the middle of the 14th century, it was one of the largest towns in the region. Now this is the point where I need to take a small detour in the video to get a little bit political, to talk about Birmingham's history of popular radical politics, because it's relevant to the city's role in the English Civil War and beyond. Because of the relative freedoms that Birmingham had won for itself during the days of serfdom, it had long been a place where more progressive and radical ideas had taken hold. Allied to this was the fact that by the start of the 17th century, Birmingham had a thriving economy and rapidly expanding, and thus more socially mobile, less conservative population. The people of Birmingham came from all over the place in terms of geography, politics, wealth and social class. It had become a very culturally pluralistic place. So when the English Civil War erupted in 1642, Birmingham naturally sided with the parliamentarians over the Royalists. This led to the Battle of Birmingham, or the Battle of Camp Hill as it was known initially, where a parliamentary regiment attempted to stop a Royalist detachment of around 1400 men under the command of the bloodthirsty Prince Rupert from marching through the town. Unfortunately, the outnumbered parliamentarians were forced back from the town, and Rupert brutally pillaged and set light to Birmingham, killing hundreds of innocent inhabitants and destroying much of the city, which further radicalised the populace for centuries to come. And as the parliamentary forces would inevitably prevail in the larger conflict, it saw Birmingham not suffer the harsh reprisals that many royalist strongholds did, giving the city an advantage going forward. And because of its status as a non-incorporated town, Brum was exempt from the laws passed by the restored monarchy after England's brief period of republican rule, which for Birmingham was a very nice historical case of having your cake and eating it. Anyways, there are numerous other examples of Birmingham's radical political history. Firstly, the city was a key hub for the non-conformist movement of the 1660s, which opposed the usage of the established Church of England following the newly restored monarchy. Later on, the city was strongly involved in the Enlightenment, especially during the 18th century, with the Birmingham Lunar Society and its prominent thinkers such as Matthew Bolton and James Watt. Many of its members were also fierce and vocal slave trade 
abolitionists, which was not necessarily a mainstream or popular opinion at the time. In the early 19th century, a Birmingham branch of the radical and officially banned Union of the Working Classes organisation was formed, and later in the same century, it was at a meeting in the city that members of the Birmingham Political Union founded the Chartist Movement, which was a nationwide radical working class suffrage movement, whose demands would unfortunately not be realised within their lifetime, but their movement was the spark for mass working class politics in Britain. And in addition to all of that, Birmingham was a hub for radical trade unionism throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And Birmingham's involvement in radical politics is a topic I may return to in greater detail in a future video. If that's something that you're interested in, let me know in the comment section below. But anyways, back to our timeline. Before the Civil War, during the Tudor period, the Lords of the Manor, the, the Birmingham family, were stripped of their English holdings, precipitating an element of increased economic freedom for the Midlands region, leading to a population boom which would mean that by 1700 Birmingham had become the fifth largest city in the whole country. It also meant that the city was very well placed to take advantage of the forthcoming Industrial Revolution, which would see Brum really take off as an economic force. Birmingham's borderline miraculous growth during the 18th and 19th centuries were down to its large and diversely skilled population, becoming especially well known for its metalworks, jewellery production and manufactured goods. Then the main difference was that whereas many industrial towns in the north of England focused on low paid unskilled labour to produce single bulk commodities like wool and cotton products, Birmingham was able to employ a more highly paid, highly skilled workforce with a strongly delineated division of labour, which was a core part of what made industrial processes work efficiently. It was basically a city working like a production line before that concept was even dreamt of. And whilst in the modern world the production line understandably comes with negative post-industrial connotations, it was a revolutionary and economically liberating idea at the time. Compared to serfdom and peasantry, specialised labour was a godsend. And it was this very economic adaptability which led Birmingham to become a powerhouse of the country, leading all comers in many fields. Between the years of 1760 and 1850, Brummies registered three times more patents than the inhabitants of any other city in the country. And by 1800, the city had more banking offices per head than any other place in the country, which led to the odd situation of bankers rubbing shoulders with revolutionaries, but it was what it was, I guess. The city then undertook the building of what would become Europe's largest civic canal network, itself born of necessity due to Birmingham lacking any large rivers to bring in raw materials and ship out manufactured produce. The world's first mechanised cotton mill opened in Birmingham in 1741 and then Matthew Bolton opened the Soho Manufactory in 1765, widely considered to be the world's first large-scale factory. And Birmingham would then change the world forever, when in 1776, Bolton and Watt developed the world's first ever industrial steam engine, the invention which would revolutionise manufacturing all over the globe. And a lot of this development was fostered by the brilliance of the members of the aforementioned Birmingham Lunar Society, an often overlooked but immensely influential Enlightenment meeting club. Its regular attendees included James Watt, Erasmus Darwin, Matthew Bolton and Josiah Wedgwood, but there were also irregular guest attendees, most notably American founding father Benjamin Franklin, who twice visited with Watt in the city. The group was of such significance that historian Eric Robinson described the Lunar Society this way. Of all the provincial philosophical societies, it was the most important. Perhaps because it was not merely provincial. All the world came to Soho to meet Bolton, Watt, or Small, who were acquainted with the leading men of science throughout Europe and America. Which is pretty high praise, and not unwarranted in the slightest. The Birmingham Lunar Society really were a massively influential group in their day, and unfortunately don't get anywhere near the amount of spotlight that they deserve in historical discussions, which is a point I may return to in a video in the future. It was by the middle of the 19th century that Birmingham was at its political and economic height, and it used that position, unsurprisingly I guess, to push for progressive political reform, with the Birmingham Political Union bringing Britain pretty close to another civil war in fact, in the face of Tory peers in London trying to block the passage of the Great Reform Act. The BPU's Newhall Hill demonstrations of 1831 and 32 were the largest political protests the country had ever seen, and eventually pressured the Lords into passing the Act in 1832, which extended parliamentary access to the newly industrialised centres outside of London. 
and it was this reputation that the city had built for itself, that of having, quote, shaken the fabric of privilege to its base, unquote, that led the original orator of those words, the liberal reformer John Bright, to base his campaign for the ultimately successful Second Great Reform Act of 1867 in Birmingham. Knowing the fear that the London elite felt towards Birmingham's fierce and radical independence of thought and action. That second Great Reform Act would extend suffrage to working class urban men, a significant advancement for its time. Now before leaving the Victorian period, I just have to take a quick detour to show you all one of my favourite buildings in the entire city, that being the Town Hall building, because it's just amazing. This is Birmingham Town Hall. It's not really the Town Hall anymore, but it was originally built as such. Anyways, right, and it's one of my favourites because, I mean, just look at it. It's a Roman temple built in the middle of Birmingham, because why not? I mean, if you have the opportunity to build a replica Roman temple, why would you build anything other than a replica Roman temple? This one was opened in 1834 as a meeting place for popular assemblies. It's now basically a concert hall, and I mean, how could you not love it? It's not just that it's a fabulously beautiful building, obviously, but that it's so ridiculously out of place in many ways. It's literally based on the Temple of Castor and Pollux from the Roman Forum. I mean, the level of pretentious dreaming it takes to place that kind of thing in the middle of the sooty, smoke-filled streets of industrial Revolution Brom is astounding. It's awe-inspiring in its combined majesty and silliness. Unfortunately, the mid to late 1800s was Birmingham's high watermark on the world stage, because although there were some advancements, including some really major ones, during the latter stages of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, such as improvements to housing and sewerage works, the opening of the Longbridge Car Plant, RIP, the building of the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery in the town centre, which is also built in that Roman style, it's amazing, the opening of the Cadbury Chocolate Factory at the Birmingham suburb of Bourneville, the foundation of the University of Birmingham, and the building of the strikingly beautiful terracotta elegance of the Victorian law courts, but the city would begin to slow and stagnate economically over this period, even though geographically it continued to grow, absorbing many smaller towns and villages on its borders. And the reasons for this economic slowdown are many and varied, as is the case with basically everything in history, but it boils down to two main factors. Firstly, that many other European countries began to industrialise and take on Britain as an economic manufacturing superpower, and this period saw the consolidation of power and capital in London draining resources away from the provincial centres, including my dear old Birmingham. And sadly, the story of Birmingham in the 20th century is undeniably one of decline, from that of an economically powerful behemoth at the start of the century to a provincial afterthought at the national level at the end of the century. The ravages of the First and Second World War had a large part to play in that, especially the latter, which saw many of its finest die in the battle for freedom, and saw the devastation wrought upon the city by the Birmingham Blitz. Now, the Birmingham Blitz is worth a video all of its own, but the short version is that between in August of 1940 and April of 1943, the German Luftwaffe targeted Birmingham for aerial bombardment due to its significance as a key manufacturing and transport hub. They dropped over 1,800 tonnes of explosives, many of which were incendiary devices, on the city, making it the third most bombed British city during the war. Around 2,200 people were killed in the onslaught and tens of thousands were made homeless. Although it's one of those historical quirks that arise sometimes, that many of the 12,400 homes destroyed in the Birmingham Blitz were slum housing which had already been designated to be torn down and rebuilt into homes fit for the 20th century only for the war to intervene in the first place. But even though the two world wars had a huge physical and economic impact on the city there was a brief economic recovery in the post-war reconstruction years but this was not to last and what ultimately finished Birmingham off as a major economic force was the deindustrialization of Britain in the latter half of the 20th century. I mean just look at this it's a human travesty. Globalisation achieved what the Luftwaffe never could. It was the final blow for the place which at its height was known as the City of a Thousand Trades and the Workshop of the World, but which very much now feels like the vestiges of a once great place. So in that sense, not very dissimilar from the rest of the country really. And it was in that Birmingham of high-rise tower blocks and harsh concrete erected in the aforementioned post-war period that I grew up in. And that city of my youth can be summed up in one building. This dilapidated and thankfully long since gone eyesore, which was part of the 1960s bullring development. The architectural and cultural abomination that I've highlighted here is the disused bullring car park. In fact, the entire old bullring centre was a dump by the time that I popped into the world, even though before I did so, they had a massive statue of King Kong there for some reason. Well, what made you decide on King Kong for a place like Birmingham? Uh, well... And the work was 
meant to be city orientated was the way it was described and uh, that made, immediately made me think of King Kong. Well, how do, how do you think King Kong is city orientated? Well, as when you think of King Kong, you think of New York. And as I must, I haven't really compared Birmingham with New York until I came in on the train this morning, actually, and then it did look quite like New York, I thought. Lord Nelson's column should be there. Lord Nelson's statue. So we stand up for What is that? Nothing. What does that represent? Yeah, that was a thing that happened. So yeah, the entire old bullring centre really needed to go. But the old car park of the bullring centre was especially egregious, as it had long since ceased functioning. It was based on an elevator system which would take the cars to the various levels, but that had broken down years before, and it was decided that it wasn't really worth spending the money to fix it. So it just lay there, a pointless blot on the Birmingham skyline. It was genuinely a literally useless building, covered in pigeon droppings. It was very much symbolic of what had happened to the city more broadly broadly, a dilapidated wreck of its former self being crapped on from a great height, whilst those in charge just let it rot. And ultimately that building's deconstruction was a symbol of the city's rebirth in the 21st century. The new bullring really is the pick-me-up the city needed, it's a tremendous addition to the local area. And I can't talk about the recent renovation of the city centre without drawing attention to the fate of the building which I personally think is emblematic of that change, that being the Birmingham Central Library. Now whilst the old building worked perfectly well as a library, it really was exceptional and its staff were a credit to their profession, but the building itself was this thing here, this architectural crime against humanity, this assault on the concept of sight, this brutalist nightmare, and what made it even worse was that it was literally a stone's throw, literally a stone's throw, from that beautiful old replica Roman temple that I told you about earlier, the old town hall. Yeah, it was just across Chamberlain Square from that beautiful thing. The contrast could not have been more staggering. This thing, this thing right here, it needed to go. And thankfully it did. They knocked it down in 2016 and have been constructing new office blocks, restaurants and shopping facilities there since, some of which have been completed with the whole of Chamberlain Square being opened in the summer of 2020. And as for the library itself, it moved about 500 yards away to its new site in Centenary Square. And just look at this wondrous beast. It is a thing of beauty. Now there is a library that a city can be proud of. And indeed, this Brummie very much is. And the contrast in these two images of what the Central Library was and what it is now is simply remarkable. The grey, heartless, soulless mess of the past and a bright new, fresh rebirth of the present and the future. It's been enormously heartening for a proud Brummie like myself and the new library was even opened by Malala Yousafzai, the city's most famous adopted daughter. A proud moment in a number of ways. Thanks for watching all the way to the finish here, much appreciated. And also thank you to Tristan from Step Back History for doing the voiceover bit there. Their channel is linked below, go and subscribe to them if you aren't already. They are awesome! Now as for this video, uh, this one was probably not as exciting as the future videos I'll be doing about like the Roman Empire, or World War II, or Alexander the Great or whatever. But I kind of love this place, so I thought, well where else could I start? You may think it's nothing, but Brom is my nothing. Anyways, if you enjoy this kind of historical video thing, give it a like, share and subscribe to the channel and all that good stuff. And if you really, really liked it, you could throw your money at me over on Patreon. All the links to that and my social media are below in the description. So until next time, ta-ra!